<laughs> oh, this is good. Oh no! No, get back on there. There we go. I have arrived at my destination. Oh, hello! <laughs> we weren't expecting that, were you? Oh, it was worth it. Hello and welcome to the attacking guide for Operation Griffin. I thought I'd let everyone choose the next map we cover after Neptune with a Twitter poll, and thanks to everyone for the input, but uh, that didn't really work out like I thought it would with a perfect 50-50. But okay, I can break the tie. I would say I enjoy playing Breakout more, but I leaned towards covering Griffin because I think there's more to talk about, and I did cover Breakout a little bit in the beta way back when. Now the usual message to kick things off, war is not about kill count, KD is not tracked, it is about working together as as a team to win, that's what'll give you the most XP anyway. Well, here we are, on the day the Battle of the Bulge began, the last major German offensive campaign on the Western Front, and we find ourselves on the Axis side, where we must escort our tanks all the way to capture the bridge at the end. In the first section, we have to escort two of the three tanks all the way across the line, and I suppose we can kick things off taking a look at some class ideas, although they will have to be very generic, as always, there is no one perfect class. I would go with any accurate rifle or maybe SMG, depending on which tank lane you want to focus on. We'll take a look at sight lines in a bit. I absolutely want either armored or the hunker training because it's very common for grenades to be spammed at the tanks as you escort them. Armored is very nice for the shell shock and tactical immunity too, but I opted for hunker here. What usually breaks the tie is if this stage of the map gives the defenders a flamethrower, and it does not. That comes later. So I don't need armored to give me that fire resistance. Having airborne is really nice to get you right back into the fight before the tank falls back too far, or they have too much time to build up a hedgehog. Infantry is decent too though for the quick strafing and extra attachment. And if you do have a rifle, the bayonet can be nice if you're pushing a tank and it becomes contested. A quick bayonet charge around the tank can be a nice way to take out that defender, giving them no time to react. If you wanted to go armored and have a different training, you could pick up any of those nice combat trainings. Lookout is incredible. Hustle, primed is kind of crappy right now after the nerfs. Maybe even slot the Panzer Shrek on there, it's not bad at taking people out. And as a grenade, a frag or sticky can always come in handy, but don't underestimate the power of smoke grenades for this objective. It isn't explicitly necessary, like for the breakout bridge building, but it can be very nice nice to block off lines of sight, especially in the A and B lanes I find. In C there's that elevated sniper platform which is harder to smoke out, but in the A lane you can block off those two defender spots at the trench barrels and the mounted gun boxes, and you could even maybe block off that one flank route into the A lane if you're working with a team. In B it's a bit more hectic with it being in the middle, but just dropping a smoke grenade down on that trench at the end can make life a lot easier, it can be hard to pick off the heads of people defending in there. So when the game begins, what tank should you try to escort? Well that depends on many things, we'll talk about the dynamic elements later, but taking a look at the lanes here, each tank lane has a buildable MG for the defenders and two hedgehogs to block the tanks. There's a buildable wall between C and B, and between B and A there's a tiny fourth lane for flanking around. My personal favorite lane to escort is A, it always feels the most safe with there only being that one main flank entry point, and the tank doesn't have to go as deep into the enemy territory as the other lanes, so I find that last 10% isn't as annoying as the other tanks. As a close range weapon user, I can stay completely safe from the sniper positions just by being behind the tank, with the only thing I have to watch being that one flank route on the side. The lane is so narrow that if somebody tries to push up from their side, the tank will usually become contested and that gives me the warning, so I can back off and try to win that fight. And it doesn't take very long for that thing to reach 100%. Obviously that example made things look way too easy, you will typically encounter more resistance, like maybe if the hedgehogs were actually built. As a rifle user or something more accurate, you can be even more protected on the left side of the tank, you have that wall on your left, the tank on your right, so all you have to worry about is that one mounted gun position. Hopefully you have a team to kind of cover your back or that might turn into a problem, but just be ready for a sniper to peek out there and you can often make it all the way if you win a couple duels on the tank. Yeah, in both those examples, things went very smoothly, but that's why I like A the most in theory. B is naturally the most hectic with it being right there in the middle, you've got all sorts of angles to worry about. You might want that wall built if you're focusing on only B or C, and C is very popular with the snipers, which can make things difficult, and even though it's on the edge, it isn't as protected as A, the wall to your right is farther away, and there's that truck and barrel position that's easier to hold as a defender. If you try to take it as an attacker, you can get shot from the trenches, or the sniper platform, or the cover behind the archway. And Anyway, I like A, but what matters more than theory are those dynamic factors I mentioned, because the endgame experience will change every time. The first thing to help you decide where to go would be where are the hedgehogs. Just check the bars to see where they've built them up. In this game, I can see they have one on B, and one just popped up on C. So I know not only will I have to destroy those if I go there, but there's also an enemy presence there. Those people might be running forward trying to build the next hedgehog in that lane. So let's go straight to A, and this is actually the same game as that super easy A escort I showed earlier. 
Another factor is where did your team go? It makes sense to help your team focus on one tank at a time because we're talking public matches here. The enemy defenses are often spread out. Like even if your entire team goes A, there will probably still be a sniper stationed at C waiting for something to happen. And by focusing on one tank at a time, you should improve your odds at overpowering the enemy. Distractions aren't a bad idea though, having people all over the map, making the announcer call out things about different tanks moving. And I don't expect you to be working with a perfectly coordinated team most of the time, which is fine. In terms of engagement range, it feels like A is the rifle lane, B is the SMG lane, and C is the sniper lane, but as an attacker, a close range weapon can always work. You'll notice I never recommended using a sniper class, and I will admit the snipers are very good in this game, you can use one if you want to, but the sit in the back style of gameplay isn't very helpful for this stage of the map. You can take out a defender, but they come right back in a few seconds. There are some attacking stages where sniper cover is helpful, like for the breakout bridge building to reference that again. The people building the bridge are sitting ducks, and it's good to have maybe one or two people disrupting the defenders so they can't spray at the bridge freely. Here though, you never need to engage with the snipers in the C lane for example, because you can just hide behind the tank and keep pushing it forward, and if you never peek them, they can never get you. You're forcing them to come to you to stop the tank. If you feel like you need a long range weapon, you can quickly hop into the tank gun to try to pre-fire where a sniper might be before they can react. The tank guns are very good for that, and they always put you out behind the tank when you get out. The only time you'd have to emerge from behind a tank is to destroy a hedgehog, which is why I highly recommend trying to destroy hedgehogs as far in advance as possible. Don't wait until the tank is blocked by one to try to sneak around and lay down beside it. You'll be fully exposed to enemies in front of you, and all eyes will be on that blocked tank, because obviously when a tank is blocked like that, they know that there's somebody on it trying to unblock it. It's much easier to go around destroying the barricades when people aren't paying attention to them, and you can go prone behind them for more cover. I know it is possible to destroy hedgehogs in other ways, with lethals and with the M1. Interestingly, the Panzerschreck seemed to do nothing at all when I tested that, and even the grenades in M1 were not very effective. It took six grenades, or three M1 rockets, or three satchel charges, which is really not worth it at all in my book. Even with the concussed training running double satchel charge, you can't kill it in one life. Maybe with a full team throwing explosives at hedgehogs, that's a good plan, but I think just planting the charges before the tank gets there is the way to go, especially when launchers make you show up on the minimap, which is pretty bad. As far as other assorted advice, in the same vein as running around destroying those hedgehogs in advance, you don't always have to be on the tank to be helpful. You can often help more by pushing up all the way to mess with defenders. I find it especially helpful with C and B to push up all the way towards that archway so that you can easily take out people in the sniper position and in the trench, as those positions can be difficult to deal with when on the tanks. It seemed like all these defenders were scrambling to pay attention to the tank and were completely ignoring me, and I was able to mess with them enough to help the tanks move forward. Now, this may be common sense to you, but I still don't see too many people doing it. The hedgehogs are not just for defenders. It's a great idea to build them up behind the tanks as you escort them. When a tank backs up into them, it will block it on the way back as well. So they work great as checkpoints to lock in your progress, and they force the enemies to go over there and destroy it if they want it to fall back any further. Also, there's a funny glitch where if you go prone behind a tank and keep pushing into it, it kind of drags you behind it at the same speed of the tank. You can even do it when the tanks are going faster after the escort is finished. Funny stuff. Anyway, as a little diversion tactic, I often go push a tank like C forward enough to get past the first hedgehog, build that thing up, and then if I'm the only one there, I'll just run back to help the team with a different tank, and that tank will just sit there on the blocked icon. If it stays there, great, maybe we'll go back to it later, or if it draws some defenders away way out there to deal with it and destroy that hedgehog, because it has that blocked icon on the map and people are attracted to it, well great, makes it easier to focus on escorting a different tank while they're occupied. Either way, I think it's worth the time to set it up. Finally, you should make use of that tank gun, but I recommend not constant use. Don't just walk up to the tank, get on the gun, and sit there until you die. Escort the tank on the ground using the tank as cover, and hop into the gun maybe when you know there's a sniper that just saw you and you can quickly take him out. Or my favorite, hop into the tank to avoid a grenade that was thrown at you, then you can hop right back out unharmed. Okay, I think that's enough of stage one. I could just talk about anecdotes and potential strategies with full teams for days, but I should stick to information that will actually help if you're just hopping into a regular public match. Now we move on to stealing three fuel casters from either site A or B. It can be three from the same site, it doesn't matter at all, although there can
can only be one canister out at a time from one site, so if you take from A it has to be delivered or destroyed before you can take from A again, but you can take from A and B simultaneously. To quickly revisit a class, the only changes I would make is having airborne for sure this time. I know the enemies do have a flamethrower dropped for them here, but mobility is key. This is a capture the flag type objective, not one where you have to sit in one place vulnerable to grenade spam. They're still a thing for sure, but I like my airborne movement speed with a quick SMG. Smoke grenades can once again be valuable. In A, it's fantastic to block off that back wall until you're maybe able to build it up to shut defenders out of the site. If you keep that back wall up on A, it's game over, just keep taking from A. It's hard to use smokes effectively in B. You can try to smoke the gap out here to help you escape with the fuel, or you can throw things through the hole in the wall, but there's nothing specifically to smoke off when enemies can just roam around in that barn. Lethals are always great too, like the good old satchel chargers. I call this the double breach maneuver. See ya, I'll be taking the barn, thanks. Although that was entering the tank escort stage. So I guess the question is, a or B? Well, I like A more in general. Both sites have walls to destroy to get inside. You might want to go prone planting that charge to avoid getting shot through the wall. And as always, you can shoot the charge to make it blow up immediately. We're a month into the game and it still seems like that's rare knowledge in public matches. And you can also blow it up in other ways, like the good old double launcher or double satchel charge. These walls aren't as hard to destroy as the hedgehogs. As I was saying though, I like A because defender positions are pretty predictable. There's going to be a guy prone or crouching immediately to the left, and there's going to be some LMG or sniper guy standing behind a half built up wall on the back of the site. Obviously not always, but I've come to expect roughly that. Pre-fire, pre-nade, smoke it off, and if you can clear it out, once you grab that fuel, you're almost immediately very safe in this route all the way back to the tank. It's hard for enemies to catch up to you going through here. You might actually be most vulnerable when you get back to the tank. The fueling takes some time, and you can definitely get shot from the B side there, so do be careful, it isn't time to relax just because you made it back. But all your teammates are spawning around that area, so they can usually recover it for you. Now covering B in theory, I find there are more places for the enemies to camp in that barn. It's harder to predict. Tons of corners, maybe a guy behind the fuel, and they have two entrances. You do as well, but one of the places you can breach is very exposed to the road. Not as useful, just like you can also walk straight into A from the road. And once you grab the fuel from B, you're not immediately in a safe-ish passageway like with A. You have to run through this somewhat open area, very vulnerable to getting shot in the back. But hey, just like with stage one, all this theory doesn't matter as much as where people are actually playing. You should go where your team is and where the enemy team isn't. If you try going A and they're met with crazy resistance, you've got four people swarming around in there, then respawn and go to B. Or if you see your team owns the entire B side of the map, definitely go B. Alternating sites can be effective too. Some people might leave their position when they hear the enemy is taking A and so on. So that's all about adapting and winning gunfights. For more general information, starting with some more obvious things, you can hop into the tank guns of both the broken down one overlooking the B area and the one that you're refueling. When you grab the fuel, you automatically pull out a machine pistol. It doesn't matter if you have a launcher or a rifleman secondary, you always get the magic machine pistol. Maybe a less obvious thing is that when you have the fuel, you can see it appears in your grenade spawn, and that's because you can indeed throw the fuel with the grenade buttons, and that can definitely come in handy. If you ever think you're in trouble, you might want to get that fuel out of your hands and closer to the tank for a teammate to pick it up. If you're with a full team, you could even form a big line and toss it to each other all the way to the tank, but that's unlikely. You can also throw it down if you need to take care of an enemy, the alternative would just be dropping the fuel by switching weapons. Here's a great example of when throwing is a great idea. I entered A from the road because the wall was built up, but running back into the road with the fuel is pretty much guaranteed death when the defenders respawn further up the road. What I probably should have done was just throw the fuel over the wall into that relatively safe lane for my team to pick up. Well, I ran into the road, but I realized my mistake. I don't need the instincts basic training to know that somebody was aiming at me right there, so I threw the fuel towards the tank to be retrieved by my team before I went down. Anyway, there's the bulk of what I have to say about the fuel running. It's like a CTF game, you'll have to win some gunfights. When the tank is refueled, it's on to escorting it all the way to the bridge and across the bridge to the end. It is impossible to recommend just one setup. I would take armored for this part though. There will be grenade spam, tacticals, flamethrowers, shell shock everywhere. It's great to have. Here is why to use armored in one clip. I just walked into that guy's flamethrower, took him out, and lived to continue holding that forward position. But airborne hunker is always good too to get back in the action quick. 
even expeditionary, which I feel like I never recommend, but the grenade spam can be very effective with how far you can throw things, especially at the end. Maybe you want armored plus concussed or something. Yeah, I won't spend any more time on class building. You can put together tons of things that'll work. Let's walk through the parts of the map. When you start escorting the tank up the road, you'll typically encounter heavy resistance when you get to this choke point, because their spawn is much closer than yours. If your whole team just keeps running at the tank and the gunfights are going roughly one to one, they'll win that fight in the end. It really helps if people use the old B-site barn to flank around and kill the people defending from there. If they're all hanging around that right side pocket, you practically have to. So break down those walls and try to get through that way if just running at the tank isn't working. Something I should bring your attention to if it isn't something you've been using, those lines marked on the tank escort bar are not arbitrary progress lines. They all mean something. Every time you escort the tank to one of those lines, the map changes. Enemy spawns get pushed further back, attacker spawns push forward, and that line on the ground that you can't cross also gets pushed forward, and sometimes certain map features are triggered to change, like walls crumble down and become no longer buildable. For example, I've got a fun, unique pro strat for you, not that it'll always work out, but the first line that the tank gets to is the 17% line. That is the point where the attacking border moves forward to include that bend in the road, and it's also the point where the tunnel collapses over by B. If you sprint through it, as an attacker, just as the tank is hitting 17%, you won't get that red warning thing because the line will get pushed up to include it, just as the tunnel collapses and can no longer be used. And now I've taken a very far forward position, it kind of messes with the enemy spawns and takes them by surprise. If you can hold that down, it might help your team get that tank around the bend. When you get the tank to 40%, that's when defender spawns get pushed way back to the bridge, and attacker spawns move much farther up, so the next bit of progress will be very easy again, until you approach the next line. And that's how things continue all the way across the bridge, a lot of pushing the tank, needing to be winning gunfights, do make use of this flank route around the right side here, and also make use of the lower scaffolding thing on the left side of the bridge, as soon as the border moves up and lets you in. Watch out for common spots like the stationary tank MG there, and people hiding behind it. It'll all come to a head at the end where it can be very difficult to make progress because their spawn is right there while your spawn is all the way at the beginning of the bridge. I might even swap to an airborne class with a smoke for the very end. This is where equipment will have to save you. Smoke and lethal spam towards their spawn will hopefully give you the edge you need to finish it out. I'll show a couple examples here of smoking off the end of the bridge and smoking off their MGs to win. But that's the lowdown on escorting the tank. Not as much to say about that section because we did spend the first section talking about escorting tanks as well and many of the same things apply of course. So I hope you enjoyed this attacking guide for Operation Griffin and hopefully you've gotten one or two strategies out of it that you weren't already using. I can't have caught everything though, feel free to leave other strategies you like using in the comments. The defending half is coming up next of course, not sure when that'll be. Hopefully I'll see you on the battlefield, on my team that is. Thanks for watching, I'll catch you next time.